Is Greg here? Okay. Uh, 85. Wow. Oh, yeah. Enjoy it. Whenever you're ready. Ready to go? 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 Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time this evening to come uh, and to uh, sit and, and get schooled on 1031. What I find in the commercial industry is that many of the clients that I've worked with in the past have, aren't really familiar with what 1031 is, how it works, the structure of it, the importance of it, and the value it can bring to your real estate portfolio. So, um, and it's sometimes difficult to uh, try to, to convey the value of that at the point of uh, through the real estate transaction. So, I'm putting together a series of classes. This is the first in a series, uh, and it's the 1031. So, what do we do with that money? Um, after you have a real estate sale and you have some capital gains, how are you going to manage that money? So, um, I've asked uh, Greg here. Greg Smith, leading with IPX 1031, to be our guest speaker this evening. And I've also had, um, worked with uh, my title company. It's uh, Fidelity National Title, Chicago Title. Uh, Joe Knapp and Ann Seaton. Ann Seaton's here tonight. Joe could be with us. He's feeling down. But Ann, um, I want to introduce Ann and have her come up and tell us a little bit about the importance of title in the, in the, in the conveyance of properties and making sure um, you have a free and clear deed making sure that everything within that language and schedules A's and B's and the whole document there is uh, uh, ready to go so that when you buy that property, you're, you're not buying any future encumbrances. So uh, let me introduce you to Ann Seaton here. I've been working with Ann for a long time, um, many, many years. <laughs> I think I used to have blonde hair when I first was introduced. <laughs> but uh, this is Ann Seaton. She's with Chicago Title Fidelity uh, National Title. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, welcome everybody. So first off, I, I wanted to um, share with everybody the connection between Fidelity National Title and Chicago Title. So Fidelity National Title is the largest um, title underwriter in the country. And then uh, uh, Fidelity owns Chicago Title. So you'll see that sometimes we write on Fidelity paper and sometimes we write on Chicago Title paper. If you have a preference, you can do either or. But I just want to just kind of make the distinction between the two companies. So Fidelity owns Chicago Title. So our office is located in Westerville, and um, my office only does commercial real estate. You know, we, any residential um, residential transactions are handled by the um, office in Worthington, and um, also we are national. So we do every state in the country. So if you have a client that is buying something here and has to sell something in another state, then I can do that for you. So um, we have that capability. So in regard to that title commitment that Mark was um, talking about, title commitment is so important. I call that the roadmap. So everything that you need to know about your transaction, what is needed to get your deal to the finish line is in that commitment. So schedule A shows us who owns the property, shows you what the legal description is. Schedule B2, that's your roadmap. So it's going to list everything that has to happen in order to get it to the finish line. And then schedule B part two, that is where your exceptions are. So generally in schedule B part one, that's gonna show you what mortgages are on the property that have to be paid off, what liens, um, there are all kinds of miscellaneous liens, such as mechanics liens, state and federal tax liens, you name it, all kinds of things out there. And then um, any anything unusual that we're, we're gonna need. So let's say for instance, 
the seller owns a piece of real estate as trustee of the trust, then we're going to need to review that trust document. It's going to be set out in that requirement. We've got to look at the trust document. We're going to need a certificate of trust. It's going to be set out, certificate of trust or memorandum of trust. That's going to be set out in Schedule B Part 1. So cut title commitment is so important. So I always recommend that you that you read them before you send them out to your client. If you have any questions about your commitment, ask your, your title officer. So um, you know, you certainly don't want to have any surprises, but it, it it's all laid out in the title commitment. So Thank you. Ma You're very welcome. Yeah. So thank you for the yeah, so I also wanted to let everybody know we have some great tchotchkes back here. Please help yourself. Um, yeah, th so th that, that is absolutely true because we don't we, normally when we take on a listing, we will call for a title commitment. It's a pre search, and we will be able to identify if there's anything of major that we should address early at the listing time, at the listing period. And so then we can move forward and get those items resolved or at least bring it to your attention so that they know that they'll have to be resolved when we go to a close. Because remember, if we can't close under the clean tile, Greg doesn't need to be here today. Right? If we, because how are we going to transfer funds into, into a, a, a property? So, um, so we have some information out back. Um, and if you want to grab our information, please do. I work with them uh, continuously um, throughout, throughout the years of my business. Next. The next, let me introduce Greg Smith. He'll come on up here, Greg. Um, he's going to go over some of the, the details uh, in all the years that he's been practicing. Uh, the 1031 exchange principles and the IRS rules and changes in the laws. Uh, he's going to go over over that today. Um, so and we're going to have a, a, a test afterwards. Okay. Just <laughs> yeah, class a few hours. Just a few hours. Okay. okay. So this is Greg Smith. So you want to come on up? You want all to right. on? Yeah. I'll, 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 oh, thank you. No, I don't think I need to on. Okay. You want to yes. stay and operate, or yeah. are you going to give me to another one? I think you just give me a look. Right. And I'll put it. Yeah, we Okay, yeah, whatever's easy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, hey, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I mean, 1031s aren't, aren't really slowing down much yet. Real estate is hot. These are still hot. Uh, this is definitely something you do want to know about. I've worked with several of you in the room already and certainly would love to, to get to know everyone. Um, I've been doing this over 20 years now with IPX. Um, really, really enjoy the business. So uh, I'll just kind of jump right into it. So, you know, it does come from a section of the tax code, section 1031. That's where the name comes from. And the basic idea here is the government is nice enough in this case to say, if you don't pocket the proceeds, but you're willing to reinvest into more property, then they won't make you pay the state and federal taxes on that sale. And it's a beautiful thing that doesn't apply to everything anymore. Uh, it doesn't apply to the stock market. You know, if you sell your Microsoft stock, but you don't pocket the money, you put all of it into Amazon stock, you still have to pay all your taxes if your Microsoft stock went up in value. So it doesn't matter that you reinvest it. But with real estate, this is a special tax break for real estate that you'll want to take advantage of. The power is absolutely huge. I've been doing this long enough now that I've seen people grow from uh, owning a one fifty thousand dollar rental condo to owning millions and millions of dollars of property and never having paid tax anywhere along the way. So it's a very beautiful thing to be able to grow your portfolio get to bigger properties, get to more properties, get to different types of properties, and 1031 allows you to do that. It's not something that is new to the tax code. It's not something that's unsettled. It's been in the tax code for more than 100 years. Okay, it came in in 1921. So 101 years now. Uh, so it's not going anywhere. Uh, we do have to fight with Congress about it because they, they like to do that. There's always every new administration, doesn't matter which side of the aisle it is, every new administration that comes in, they have programs they want to pay for, right? So they always come in and, all right, we got to come up with the money to pay for this stuff. Nobody wants to go in and say they're 
you know, growing the deficits, even though they all do. Uh, so they always have to say, here's where the money's coming from. Here's how we're going to pay. So every time we have to go back to Capitol Hill, we have to lobby. And what's strange is, and this would not be common sense to people, getting rid of 1031 will cost the government money. There's no question about it. So you don't have to feel bad about using 1031. 1031 helps the economy, and we can prove it in very specific numbers. Um, Ernst & Young did a major study. They've actually done the study twice now over the years. And a couple of college professors, one from Syracuse, one from Florida, they also did a study. One was macroeconomic, one was microeconomic. I'm going to bore you with all these details. But the bottom line is they showed very specifically the government will lose billions and billions and billions every year if they get rid of 1031. And the, the short logic behind that is a lot of sellers are savvy and sellers aren't going to sell their property if they have to pay big taxes and can't reinvest. They're just going to hold their property. So it's going to slow the markets down. When it slows the markets down, that means a real estate agent's not making a commission. A 1031 guy is not making his couple of bucks. The title company back there, and's not doing deals. All the players, and there's so many players in the real estate market, you know, the lenders, the uh, construction workers, on and on and on, they're all doing less business. They're all paying less in income taxes. So you can prove that slowing down the deal flow hurts everybody. So 1031 is a good thing for the economy. I mean, just, yeah, I'm not going to bore you with all the details because I'd like to. It's a 100-page report, but absolutely brings so many jobs to the economy and more money to the government. It would kill local governments to get rid of 1031 because they need prices to do well and deals to be happening, all those conveyance taxes and everything else that they're making money on. So this is not a tax break for the wealthy that hurts the country. I do a lot of deals each year that are $50,000 sales and nationwide, our average sale price is something around $300,000. That's even with those $100 million, occasional billion dollar deals mixed in. So yeah, 1031 is a good thing. It's been around a long time. And it's not going anywhere. All right, so uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. There are so many reasons to use 1031. I was already discussing some of these with a few of you ahead of time. There's a lot of reasons to use it other than just not wanting to pay taxes you don't have to pay. A lot of it's about what you want to do with your portfolio. So, you know, let's say you've got three kids that live around the country, and one's in Florida, one's in Texas, and one's in California. And you want them to be able to manage properties. So you sell property, you buy properties where the kids are located. You let them learn how to manage the properties. When you pass away, you let them inherit their respective properties and their areas. Things as simple as that for estate planning. Sometimes it's that you just you own bare land and you say, well, this is great. And I think it's gone up in value a ton through the years, but I want to get into something that's income producing now. So you sell your land and you buy an apartment complex, you buy some uh, commercial office building, shopping center, what have you. Um, sometimes it's you own 10 rental properties around town and you say, you know what, I don't want to do all that traveling anymore. Let's sell the 10, buy one apartment complex and do everything in one place. There's just hundreds and hundreds of reasons why people use 1031 that really aren't about avoiding the taxes. That being said, Let's talk about the taxes. So it's always worse than people think. I talk to people every day and they say, well, it's only 15%. My CPA says rates are going to go higher in the future. Maybe I'm just better off paying it now and, and you know, not worrying about it. I just don't agree with the logic at all. First of all, the one thing you want to know is it's never just 15%. It's always more than that. Even if you're selling bare land with nothing on it that needs to be depreciated, you're at least going to have that 15% plus state tax. So Ohio, talking about 5%. We'll see that in a minute. But for most people that own something with improvements on it, you got to worry about depreciation. You got to worry about higher tax levels. So check out the next one. Perfect. I think if you click one more time, yeah. Oh, oh there you go. yeah. It's hard to get used to a lot of make two clicks. Yeah. All right, so the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, added a 3.8% tax that kicks in when you hit certain income levels. So on larger deals or clients with higher incomes, another 3.8 on top of the 
can move forward, please. And these numbers, I think, have actually been adjusted a little higher to inflation yet. I don't think I updated this, the exact numbers, but when you hit higher income levels still, it goes up another 5%. This came out of that fiscal cliff thing 70 years ago now. I lose track of time, but it's been on the books for a while now. So on large deals or high income, you're at 23.8% to jump off with. Okay. And then people forget about the depreciation. I know a lot of you are real estate investors in here. Sometimes I'm dealing with groups that, that uh, aren't going to be as involved in you and they don't know about depreciation. But for those of you who don't, it's the idea that the buildings we're in are crumbling away over time. So if you're in a commercial building, they came up with a idea that crumbles in 39 years. If you're in residential property, they say 27 and a half years. So that's a great tax break again, you get as a real estate investor. So let's say you bought this building, let's just make up and say it's $5 million. And they deem that a million dollars is the land value, $4 million is the value of the improvements, the building. You take that 4 million, and in this case, you would divide it by 39 because it's commercial property. If this was an apartment building, it would be 27 and a half. And that's the tax break you get each year. And that's a beautiful thing because the rents you're making on your property, you can use that to offset all or some of it, depending on how much is coming in rents and how much your depreciation credit is. So it's a beautiful thing. However, you've done well on your property. You're gonna sell this building years down the road. It hasn't gone down in value as was predicted by the government with their straight line depreciation. It's gone up in value. So now Uncle Sam is gonna stick his hand out He's going to say, wait a minute, we gave you all those credits through the years. We shouldn't have given it to you. Your property went up in value. We want our money back. So they take the total of the credits you've received through the years, and they tax it at 25%. So not only can it be the biggest tax in a lot of deals, it's one a lot of people don't see coming. They forget about or they don't know about it. And also it's one that really can sneak up on people if they felt like their investment wasn't even a good one, right? They bought this apartment complex for 800,000 many years ago. And now here they are selling it for right around 800,000. They think, you know, this is terrible. I did horrible on this investment. But maybe they forgot they took 500,000 of depreciation credits through the years and they're gonna pay a 25% tax on that $500,000. So that can really sneak up on people. So you don't wanna forget about all these other taxes that apply. All right, one more set of taxes, like I mentioned earlier, the state tax. Ohio's not the worst. We're uh, just under 5% really when all is said and done is what it comes out to in Ohio. You look out there at the left coast, California gets there, gets you at 13.3%, right? And we do have a lot of investors that are selling in California and buying in Ohio or the Midwest or somewhere else. So you can kind of take advantage of that. If you leave Ohio and buy in Florida, Texas, Nevada, a few other states, you can go from a 5% tax to a 0% tax at the state level. That could be nice, uh, get rid of a little bit. But every state had its own quirks. Uh, Pennsylvania was the last one to get on board. It just recently passed 1031 at the state level. It was the last state to do so. So starting January 1st, all 50 states will respect 1031 on their state level taxes as well. Obviously, the biggest part of the tax is you have rules, so you've always been able to use 1031 for that, but states have their own rules. Pennsylvania, up until almost now, has made you pay the state level taxes when you sell. Now all 50 will be on board. Uh, but all kinds of quirks are out there with holding rules, things will help you with. California is a big one because, again, so much activity is going on out there. When you sell in California, decide you want to reinvest in Ohio, maybe you want to clear, you want to keep your rental properties around you, let's say, or your commercial yeah. properties. Well, California has something called a clawback provision. Okay. They're not nice enough just to say, oh, sure, leave, go, go somewhere else, and we're not going to tax you. What they say is you need to do a filing with us for now on. So every year you file in California and say, hey, I've not yet sold my Ohio property. And then if one day you do sell Ohio and you don't do another 1031 exchange, that's where California claws back in the deal to get their taxes. So four or five states currently have clawback provisions. 
California is the big one. And again, it matters because it's 13.3% out there. So, yeah, thank you. So we like to use the term in this industry, swap till you drop, all right? Uh, it's a home run, you know, you know, not that you anyone needs to be in a hurry and nobody needs to die to get a tax break. But when you do, when you, when you do pass away, that's when it becomes a home run and your heirs are very, very happy. Because what happens is your estate should end up paying zero in taxes. Your heirs get what's called a stepped up tax basis. If you leave them this building and they're saying it's worth $5 million at the time you pass, your favorite daughter gets it for $5 million. She says, well, I don't want to manage that property. So she sells it the next day to someone for $5 million. 100% tax-free money benefit. Taxes go away. So that's a home run. There's some other tax breaks we'll talk about in a few slides. That could be nice as well. But that's the biggest one. Get in your state, the taxes go away. So the last thing you want to do, you know, you're, you're, you're 110 years old and you're on your deathbed. Don't sell your property then and pay the taxes. I have a lot of people come to us and say that. They, they say, Greg, I... I don't want to leave a tax burden to my kids, things like that. They think they should sell and pay the taxes. I'm saying, no, your, your kids are going to be much happier with you if you hold on to that property and you just pass it to them tax-free. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't sell at the last minute. Don't do that. First. All right. I should have said earlier, please uh, talk, make comments, interrupt me, ask questions anytime you want. I want to be interrupted. I want to have a conversation. I want to make sure we're talking about the things you want to talk about. Any specific questions you have get answered. Um, so any questions so far about the taxes? Okay. Yeah, they're always more than you think. Yes, sir. Got a quick question. Please. <clears throat> so um, in, in residential sales, is, is there a capital? Um, what's the capital gains on residential sales for a single person and a married person? And then the yeah. question is, maybe it's half a million dollars, right? And you're talking about the sale of principal residence. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Let's say I sell a principal residence, but I sell it for millions of dollars. Right. And now you, you over exceed the tax um, reprieve, I guess, whatever. So right. what, what, what happens? Is that, can that be used for 1031? Right. Well, I'm going to have a slide on this a little bit, so you're going to get more detail later. Should look at your slide. Oh, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, it's, I just, uh, it's a good question. So, um, the short answer for now is under section 121, which deals with principal residences, like you alluded to, uh, as a single filer, you don't pay any taxes unless you have more than 250,000 gain. As joint filers, you have to have more than 500,000 gain. So, the government, again, is nice enough there to say we don't really want to make people pay taxes on the sale of their principal residence. There are some qualifications. You need to have lived there for at least two of the past five years when you sell a few other things to me. But most of the time, people don't have to pay taxes. Now, I had a guy out of Cincinnati a few years ago. I was going through a deal with him, and he was talking about selling his property for over $2 million, the taxes, and when he used 1031. And we were pretty far into the conversation when I realized he was selling his principal residence. This was many years ago now. That's probably 18 years ago. He had a very expensive residents uh, down in the Cincinnati area. So I said, well, I have bad news and I have good news. The bad news is 1031 doesn't apply to you. The reason is 1031 is only for real estate that's owned by a business, used in the business for held for investment. So, you know, if you own this building, right, you're using it as your brokerage here, it's your business, 1031 eligible. Or if you own rental properties that you rent out to other people, 1031 eligible. But it's a place you live, they consider personally held property. And the same thing applies to uh, pure vacation homes, you know, ones you don't rent out, but you just use for your family. Those are not 1031 eligible. So I had the bad news for him, and I told him that. The good news is I have a plan for you. Go back to your buyer, say you're going to revamp the deal, and you'll sweeten it for them somehow. But rent it. They can move in right away, but you'll rent it to them for two years. Then you'll buy at your new price. Two years down the road, do the 1031 exchange. That's exactly what he did. He didn't want to pay you know, more than 1.5 million in gain, which is what this guy had. It was almost all gain on the sale. And uh, that, that small exclusion wasn't going to do enough for him. 
So I think the key thing is yeah. to run it back for two years. Yeah, I mean, and right. you don't have to be yeah. nervous, you're out of luck. You, right. You, you know, yeah, this isn't going to apply to a lot of people. Most of us are not lucky enough to have huge gains on the sale of our principal residence. So usually it's tax free. But if you do have that huge gain, yeah, that's something you can consider. Um, move out of it, start running it for a while. It wouldn't even have to be in two years, but we'll get into that in a little, little bit. All right. Um, but yeah, that's that's the idea. That's the concept. So 1031 always has to be business or investment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah I got a question You're talking about the older whatever it's the hundreds of years old. Uh, are you talking about step out basis type of thing instead right. of a 1031? Right. Anytime you die with real estate, whether it was part of a 1031 or not, your real estate can get passed on to your heirs with a stepped up basis. Yeah. So yeah. those are tax free. I mean, those, I don't call it tax free, but the previous right. file becomes zero. Right? Yeah. I mean, really, it is tax free. That, yeah. You know, tax free to the estate, tax free to the heirs. Now, if the heir holds on to the property for 10 years and during that period goes up more in value, then they'll pay some taxes when they sell it for what happens in addition to that value that when you passed. Um, but if they sell it for what it's worth at the time the person passes, tax free. Is there something like a time limit on that step up thing, like a step up basis? There's like a certain time limit you have. Let's say you inherit a property from your father. Okay? Sure. Right? <laughs> and uh, who just passed away? Mm -hmm. There's like a specific time limit they have to sell the property. To be honest, no, not at all. I mean, whoever inherits it, the 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 new stepped up basis is supposed to be set at the person's death. Okay, yeah, they're supposed to do that at the time the person inherits oh, it. Oh, so then, at that point, it's set. Yes. And then, you know, whether they sell it a month from then or twenty years from then, okay. that's their tax basis moving forward. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Please. the stepped up value is that determined only through an appraisal or the sale price? An appraisal is the best and safest way to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't think technically it's required. Everyone could agree on it. Um, I don't but think parties that... agree on a sale, and that's the step up value. Wouldn't it? Like if you're selling uh, a property, I'm buying it, and you know, yeah, we agree on the sale price. Is that the step up value, or would it be? An I appraisal? think you're supposed to determine the value at the person's death, yeah, right. So I don't think you can say two years later I sold it for this. Yeah. So that's what it's worth. You know, it's it's got to be the person's debt. Yeah. All right, great. All right, so um, we go back. I think I think I skipped over one. Yeah. So like kind property. You hear these called like kind exchanges, and it used to mean more because before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2018. Things were very different. In 2017 and before, on any given day, I was doing exchanges of aircraft, of business equipment, of fun things like artwork, racehorses, collectibles. Anything with a capital gain used to be 1031 eligible. The only real exceptions were stocks, bonds, and notes. Those were never 1031 eligible. But almost everything else that existed that could have a gain that you have to pay taxes on you could use in a 1031 exchange. So the government had rules. You know, why they have a lot of these rules, no one really knows. Why they matter, no one really knows. But there's a lot of rules. If you sold an aircraft, you had to buy an aircraft. If you sold a certain kind of business equipment, you probably had to buy really the exact same thing or something very similar to it to qualify in a 1031 exchange. But with real estate, it's always been incredibly flexible. It's any kind of business or investment use real estate can be traded for any type of business or investment use real estate. So it's perfectly okay to go from retail to single family or the single family rentals to industrial, bare land to a shopping center, on and on. Anything for anything is like kind if it's business or investment real estate being traded for business or investment real estate. So that confuses people. A lot of people don't do exchanges because they say, oh, I'm selling a duplex. I don't want to go buy another duplex. I mean, I've heard this hundreds of times through the years that people learn it. And they say, oh, if I had known, I would have been exchanging all along. And uh, it's kind of painful. But the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act got rid of 1031 for everything except for real estate. Now it only applies to real estate. 
So it hasn't made my job better in the long run, but it's made it simpler. I don't have to worry about a lot of those questions anymore. Real estate's been hot since this happened in 2018. So we've still been going crazy and it's all 70 hour weeks. Someday the real estate cycle will slow down some. When that happens, I'm not gonna be able to fall back on talking to companies and doing exchanges of their giant printing press for the new printing press and aircraft and those things again. So, so eventually it'll be painful, but right now, thankfully, real estate's hot. So it's not a big deal, but. Don't be confused. Yeah, like the last, the bottom one, like the first one. Did... Yeah, percentage interest is a tick. So tick stands for tenants in common, and that's any time you own property, <laughs> multiple owners just own it in their own names. So if you and I own a property together, we're 50-50 owners, and our names are the ones on the deed, as opposed to we set up an LLC or general partnership or corporation and own it in some kind of entity. Instead, we just own it in our own names. That's considered tenants in common ownership. You're considered separate owners of the property, not any kind of partnership or entity. And they let you buy or sell percentage interest in a tick. They don't let you buy or sell percentage interest in a partnership. Okay, so if the two of us had a 50-50 LLC, I can't turn around and sell Jim my 50% interest into a 1031. Because the IRS says, no, we don't want to track that. We don't want to deal with it. Now, what I can do is maybe drop my interest out and then sell him my interest coming out of my name as opposed to the LLC. There's all these creative things you can do to make it work, but you can't buy or sell a partnership interest or an LLC interest as part of a 1031 exchange, with the one major exception being you can buy or sell 100% of the membership interest in an LLC because you make it a disregarded entity. And this actually comes up, so I'll bore you with this real quick. A disregarded entity is because the IRS ignores a single member LLC, for example. They don't exist to the IRS. At the federal level, you have C corporations and S corporations, you have different kinds of partnerships, and then you have sole proprietors. You don't have single member LLCs. A multiple member LLC, two or more people, that's a partnership under federal law. So LLCs are state law creations. You can go form an Ohio LLC or a Delaware LLC and so on. Um, the feds ignore it. And because of that, you have some flexibility when it comes to a lot of things 1031-wise. This is huge in Ohio. Some of you have come across it, but you want to know about it because if you get into a real estate deal, someone may ask you for it one way or the other. Ohio is really the only state that does this right now where you can still get away from hiding the sale price from the counties, okay? So instead of just doing a deed from me to you and it shows, oh, this property was worth $500,000, instead, I can set up a new LLC, I can transfer the property into my LLC and then transfer 100% of the membership interest in that LLC to you. So you've acquired the property without telling the county how much it costs. That helps people a lot in certain situations because either their taxes don't go up or it takes a long time for the taxes to go up. So we see a lot of these type deals in Ohio where people are selling 100% of the membership interest of LLC and it's perfectly legit. It's, it's, it's not against the law. So people use it and it works for 1031 purposes as long as you're transferring 100% of the membership interest and what they call a disregarded entity, a single member LLC. So this wouldn't work, for example, if my wife and I own a property and we deed a property down into an LLC and then transfer the membership interest. Because the IRS says, oh no, that was, that was its own entity. That was a partnership with two people, Greg and Mara in it. So it doesn't work for 1031 purposes. We can't exchange in that situation. It has to be, if, if I own the property alone, or an LLC owns it or a corporation, something that you get it in, you make the LLC or the individual or the corporation the sole owner, then you do it. So it gets more, if you have two people as tenants in common, my wife and I, let's say, owning a property, we would actually have to deed down into two separate LLCs, one for my 50%, one for hers, transfer those to the buyer, and you can accomplish the same thing. It's a little more complicated. All right. Well, getting off track, getting too technical, and now we're going to for people to sleep, but uh, it's good to know that stuff because it really does come up a lot in Ohio. All right, here's the erase rules 
This is also not common sense, and the average person does not understand it. Okay, because a lot of people come in and they say, all right, Greg, I, I just want to reinvest my gain and not pay any taxes. Or I just want to spend all the proceeds and not pay any taxes. Things like that. Well, that's not how it works. When I said at the beginning, the IRS wants you in a position where nothing has changed, that you own property B now that you've acquired instead of property A that you sold, but the numbers are equal or higher. You haven't pocketed anything. You haven't been relieved of debt. That's what they want to see. They want nothing to have changed. They see that, no taxes are due. So here's what it is specifically. They start out by saying they want you to buy a property of equal or greater value. That's not totally true because real estate, um, the, the, the fees, the real estate commissions, title fees, um, the things that people in the back room like, uh, those come off the top. All right. So you're not expected to make up. For real estate commissions, closing costs, and things like that. Um, that's nice. The government doesn't make you reinvest that portion of it. They're already paying out. But they do want you to reinvest the net proceeds that are left. So don't pocket any of the cash from the sale. If you do, you're going to pay some taxes on that portion. Number three, replace the value of the debt. That's the part a lot of people don't understand. If you're paying off $400,000 on your closing statement to the bank, they want you to go get a new loan on your new property of 400000 or more, so it's matching up. Now, if you decide to buy a, a nuclear waste dump and no bank will make you a loan on it, there is a way to still become tax-free. You're just going to have to add 400000 of your own cash instead of borrowing it from the bank. So you can, you can offset the debts on the sale with either new debt or new cash from outside of the exchange, some combination of the two. Number four doesn't come up too often. Receive nothing that's considered non like kind property. Let's say you sold, as an easy example, a million dollars of farmland in Ohio and you bought a million dollar hotel. At first, that looks perfect. But if it's a working hotel, then we know there's going to be more to the purchase price than just real estate. You're really buying kitchen equipment and furniture and things that the IRS won't call real estate. Things that uh, Mark's going to teach you about in your next class on cost segregation, where you would go into that hotel, you would use a cost segregation study, you would chop everything up, and you would get additional tax breaks from that. So there's a plug for your next class. So everyone's going to show up for that one, too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in this example, though, if you sold a million of farmland, bought a million dollar hotel, the IRS would say, okay, that's a million dollars of real estate on the front end and say 700,000 of real estate on the back. So you're either gonna pay tax on the difference or you need to go out and buy a second property. <coughs> so that's what it means by getting something that's not like coming. So then, then you go back. So for the first point, like equal or greater, right? Right. Suppose so you have a property of a million dollars, right? So you invested 200,000 initially, right? So does that 200,000 has to be included in this one or we can take that one? Right, so you wanna think of this, there's two different math problems and I'm not gonna make anyone do math tonight, but um, the first one is if you're paying the taxes, let's say you're just doing a regular sale and paying the taxes, then the 200,000 that was your original tax basis when you bought the property, then that matters. So if you sell it for a million, you have 800,000 a gain, you're only gonna pay taxes on 800,000 of gain at that point, right? But when you're doing the 1031, now the IRS does not care about that 200,000. They don't care about what your tax basis is. They just want to pretend nothing's changed, really based on, you can say, your sales price or your net sales price. Again, you get to take the closing costs off the top, then that's your magic number. So sell for a million, 100,000 of closing costs. Let's say there's no debt for an easy example. So you're actually getting 900,000 of cash. They need you to reinvest the whole 900,000 cash to owe no taxes. If instead you also paid 400,000 bank and you're walking away with 500,000 of cash, you need to use the 500,000 of cash as down payment, get a loan for 400,000 on your property. Now you owe no taxes. Now, the average exchange people are going to buy more expensive property. So they use all the cash as down payment, they borrow as much as they can or as much as they need for that property. Um, but if you go down in value, you're going to owe some tax no matter what, you know, by more than the closing costs. So you're either going to get cash going back in your pocket or you're going to have debt that's not replaced. 
that part of it will be what they call boot, either cash boot or mortgage boot, that you owe taxes on. That makes sense? Yeah. One more question. Please. The previous slide is on my, about the 50% of like if the LLC has a 50%, like we both own a land and we have 50% partner. Right? Oh, gotcha. But if we sell it, right? So do we have to carry that LLC as long as that property or the next property exists? Like, yeah. So if you're in a partnership, you know, two two member LLC or more, that is considered its own taxpayer, right? It has to file its own tax return. Unlike again, a single member LLC, you don't have to file a tax return. That information goes on your own personal tax return. But when you've got two people in it, so if you sell a property, you do have to show the IRS it's the same taxpayer completing the exchange. So you're either going to buy in that same LLC, same name, or if let's say you named your old LLC, you know. 41 South High Street LLC. So you don't want to use that as the name of the new place. Then what a lot of people would do is just set up a new LLC, whatever you want to name it. But 41 South High Street has to be the sole member of the new LLC. And then it works because the IRS will still see the same taxpayer on both sides. But in general, yeah, you've got to, you've got to have continuity of taxpayer. One more thing. Please, please, <laughs> so, good uh, questions. So when, when we bought this land, right, we, we did not buy under LLC. We, we bought under our names, right? Then okay. later we created the LLC, but we never transferred that land to the LLC. It still exists on individual yeah. names, but we file tax as an LLC. Yeah. So how does that work? Yeah, I see that all the time. And I think the correct way to deal with it, because if you sell it in just your names, our company, we'd be forced to treat it, you know, shut up the exchange in your names. We can't set up the LLC because the IRS said, no, that's, that's not what went on. So I think the best way to handle that is in your contract, when you would go to sell it, tell your buyer, hey, we're actually going to deed this into our LLC before we deed it to you. So we'll sign the contract as the LLC. Um, that way, by titling it to the LLC before you sell it, it matches up with what you've been telling the IRS. And then you would do your 1031 exchange in the LLC name. That's that's really how you want to do it there. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. Yeah, these are practical. They come up a lot. All right. Go ahead for the next. All right. All right, perfect. Yeah, on this one. Oh, back one. Oh no, sorry, next wherever we're on next one. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Quick example on this stuff. Uh, it's actually two examples. All right, we're saying you're selling a property for a million dollars, 300,000 of debts paid off on the closing statement. You've got costs of the sale, again, real estate commissions, type of fees, those things of $60,000. But you're walking away with net proceeds of 630,000. Now, the first thing you want to understand is in a 1031 exchange, sometimes I forget to say this during my presentation, you can't touch the money, okay? If you touch the money or even have the right to touch the money when the closing occurs, it becomes a taxable sale. So that's why we were called the qualified intermediary, our company. We get involved before that initial sale takes place. We end up getting assigned into your contract as the technical seller on your behalf. The money comes into the exchange account with us. And then within 180 days, you've got to reinvest it and talk more about the time periods. Um, but don't let your closing go by. Don't let them give you a check or wire your funds. It does become taxable when that happens. So when I say there's net proceeds of 640, you know, and back there is going to wire those funds into the exchange account that we've set up on your behalf, and it's going to be held there. And then uh, you're out there looking for your replacement property. Uh, next, please. Hang on, click a few times. All right, perfect. All right. So in this example, you know, the Sullivan Group finds you the perfect property that you wanted. So 1.3 million, you're very happy. That's what you wanted. You move your business, let's say, into that property. The debt was 300,000 when you paid it off. You get a new loan for 660. You use the cash as a down payment. You don't have to come out of pocket for any more cash. You're happy about all that. This is kind of the most standard type of 1031 exchange. No taxes are due because you went up in the debt, stayed equal in the net proceeds. Perfect. Don't know Ohio anything. Don't know the feds anything. Click the next one, please. Now, in this example, 
because the Sullivan Group is so good at what they do, he goes out and he negotiates the seller down. He was looking for million dollar properties for you. He gets that seller down to 800,000. Well, that's still a good thing. You still want to get the property as cheap as you can, but because you've gone down in value, you don't need as large a loan. The loan went from 300,000 to 260, and you end up pocketing some of the cash. You had 640 to use, you only use 540 of it. You've got $140,000 of taxable boot. This might not be the end of the world. Again, you could go out and buy a second property if you want, be 100% tax deferred. There's other kinds of investments we'll, we'll talk about a little bit that you might throw money into. Um, let's take the first example, kind of like this gentleman's example a minute ago. Let's say your tax basis was $200,000. You've got $800,000 of gain here when you sell it for a million. Well, of that $800,000 of gain, you're only paying the taxes on $140,000 of it, deferring the taxes on all the rest. That's still a win. That's still a lot better than paying all the taxes. Um, but let's say maybe you only bought this property a few years ago and the tax basis was $900,000. You had a $100,000 gain you were trying to avoid and you only ended up buying property for $800,000. That's not good because you're, you're not going to have to pay tax on $140,000, but you'll still pay the taxes on the $100,000 of gain. And in essence, the 1031 didn't do you any good. So you wouldn't plan this ahead of time if your tax basis was $900,000. Or you'd have to you'd have to go out and buy a second property to make this make sense. All right, Again, does that kind of make sense somewhat? I know we're throwing a lot at you in a short time. Um, most of this stuff is in this book. Uh, take a look through that. That'll help on a lot of these topics that I move through quickly. All right, line along. Okay. Another call I get quite often is someone walking through what seems like a perfect 1031 opportunity, but I'll ask, how long have you owned this property? And they'll say, well, I've owned it for three months. I say, okay, so tell me more. And what's interesting is it comes down to a lot of gray areas often as to whether they're 1031 eligible or not. The IRS calls it an intent-based test. So there's no rule that you have to own your property a certain length of time before you can use 1031. Instead, the rule is, what was your intent when you bought it? If your intent was to hold it for investment, so you bought it and you thought, I'm gonna hold this and run it for the next 20 years, but you know, Jim comes up to me the next day and says, Greg, I've always wanted that property. I did my loan put together in time. I'll pay you $100,000 more today than you paid for it yesterday. Great, yeah, that sounds good. I can sell to him, I can do a 1031 exchange, even though I owned it for one day, because my intent wasn't to sell it. I got an unsolicited offer, decided to take advantage of it, normal business decision. Now, if I buy it and I say, you know what? I really wanna be in the business of flipping properties. I wanna buy it, I wanna rehab it, I wanna sell it. I wanna do that every three months over and over and over. The government says, yeah, we're not really wanting you to be able to use 1031. We consider that to be the inventory of your business. Not really any different than MI Homes or some big home builder where you're buying it, you're building homes, you're selling them off. That's a business. That's the inventory of your business. You got to pay ordinary income taxes. We don't want to give you capital gains treatment or 1031. So there's a ton of gray area there. You know, did you really intend to hold it? Did you really intend to flip it? Um, what about if it's maybe either, neither or both? Where you say, oh, I'm buying it, market conditions are crazy. Maybe I'd sell it at the right offer. Maybe I'll hold it as a rental. Maybe I'll see how things go. So, tons of gray area, but it comes down to uh, what your intent was, technically. If someone comes and says, well, my intent was kind of both, I might say, yeah, I mean, I'd be fine with doing it. I would do it, but on your next one, don't do it again. You know, don't buy one and sell three months later on your next one if the front end looks suspect, right? You got to at least make it look good. So it's interesting, but uh, it's all about intent. I'm going to skip over that other stuff so we can go to the next slide because it's going to be coming up again later. All right, 45 and 180 days. We've kind of been alluding to some of this. Call it delayed exchange, standard 1031 exchange. So from whenever you would sell, today's your closing date, next day is gonna be that day one. 
They only give you 45 days to identify what you want to buy. That's really the hardest part of a 1031 exchange for most people. Uh, then you have 180 days, which also runs from the day of the sale. So it's 45 plus another 135 to get closed. That's usually easy. Sure, we see a few uh, tens of thousands of exchanges each year. We'll see a few where they have trouble getting closed by the end, but that's usually not the problem. If you're identifying what you want in 45, you typically can get closed within another 135 days from then. There's no mercy on this, okay? Uh, there are two and only two ways to get extra time, and they're really not things you want. The first is military deployment. If they send you overseas to fight in a war, they are nice enough to say, we'll give you extra time. Uh, so none of, us, none of us probably want to deal with that. Uh, number two is a federally declared emergency. So these come up more often than you would think. We've got them going on right now in Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, and various other parts of the state from other types of uh, country, from other parts of uh, other types of disaster. Um, so, excuse me. So even then, you have to be affected by it. In other words, just because there's a disaster somewhere wouldn't give us in Columbus, Ohio, extra time. It has to be a situation where, oh, I was going to buy a property at Fort Myers Beach and it's not there anymore. You know, yes, that will get you extra time. Um, but you don't, you don't get it for, for no reason. You have to show how you're affected. Excuse me, but other than that, there are, there, there's just no mercy here. You don't get extra time for weekends or holidays or calendar days, and you have to get it done in time or pay your taxes. Uh, there are some interesting things. I'll talk about one in a couple more slides, but let's say you were selling December 1st, and uh, you, you, you identify what you want within 45 days. It gets to be April 15th. And you haven't completed your exchange yet. Well, what happens? Don't file your taxes. Okay, if you file your taxes, you killed your exchange and your taxes are owed. Now. What you need to do is ask for your automatic extension. That will get you your full 180 day period. You can finish your exchange, then file your taxes. Okay, so that doesn't come up too often, but if someone closing right at the end of the year, if they don't close quickly on their replacement property to where they're done by April 15th. They would need to ask for the automatic extension. But the good news is you can always get your 180 days in. Yes, sir. In just experiential, what percentage of people are actually in contract for one of the three problems that they have What what percentage are in contract within the 45 day period? Um, I would say uh, a pretty high percentage. Over time, you know, over about 20 years of I'm looking at this, probably 75%. They're generally you know? in contract with people. Yeah, and, and a lot of those people are in contract before they even sell their relinquished property. That's perfectly okay to do. You don't have to wait. You know, if you know your closing's coming up in 30 days, get out there and get looking for your replacement property if you don't already know. Get into contract as quick as you can. In a perfect world for you as the exchanger, if you can get that seller of the replacement property to agree to a contingent contract, then you're going to feel completely safe, contingent on the sale of your other property going through. Sometimes they're not going to agree to that, especially in really hot markets, um, but sometimes they won't. And so that's ideal. And if they won't agree to that, then maybe you wait until you're very confident your deal is going to go through and you take the risk and sign the contract and hope for the best. Or maybe you know wait till the money is actually in the exchange account to, to go out and do that. Um, just a market decision based on if you think that property will still be there and how much you really want it, right? But I think the vast majority are probably a contract, especially these last couple of years. Obviously, there are people that got in that situation where they would identify, say, three properties by day forty-five. On day fifty, all three are sold to somebody else. Guess what? The IRS again, no mercy. The IRS says we don't care who owns them, owns those. You can still go buy. <laughs> go go <laughs> negotiate with the new owner. It's not always realistic. But that's what the IRS would have to say. Yes. So I'm just confused about the 45 day. Is that um, is the is the 45 day part of the 180 day? 
It is. So it's 45 and then another 135 after it for the full 180. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, so the definition of identifying the potential, like, you know, it, it's like you have to get into the kind of side contract. Um, yes, yeah, so you don't have to be in contract. It's really as easy as it is. you could write down an address that counts as an identification. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit. Might be the next slide. I can't remember what order I put it, but we'll talk about identification in just a moment in a little more detail. But yeah, so you're not required to be a contract. It just can be a you know, if you can get in the contract, your exchange will be that much safer and much more likely to succeed, right? Than if you just name some and maybe someone else is going to go buy those, or maybe you're going to do your own due diligence and not like those properties anymore. Once you're past 845, you can't make any changes. So the faster you can move, the better. So you can identify as many properties as you want, but like hundred. They're, they're, they're limited. They're okay. limited. So I'll put you off on that one because it'll be coming up in just a moment where you'll see the details. Is there any other question for now? Okay. Uh, all right, we'll do this mini deferral and then we'll be on to the ID. So the mini deferral <coughs> can be a bonus of even a failed 1031 exchange. So let's say you're closing on your property with Ann back there on December 1st. And you're in the position where you, you don't already know what you're going to buy. You're out there looking. Um, you just don't find it. You know, that happens sometimes. I mean, the vast majority of our exchanges are succeeding. I would still put it even during COVID, 90% plus of exchanges are successful. But some fail. Some just, that happens. People don't find what they want or can't close on it or sellers back out. All the things that we know can happen. And you don't find what you want in that 45 days. So the middle of January, our company's going to wire your money back to you. You get it back on day 46. You're going to end up paying taxes. But the good news here is you could decide to put off your tax bill. So let's assume for a minute it's an all cash sale. You don't have to pay off any debt. That's the simplest example. You're getting your money back, not in 2022 now, but you're getting your money back from the QI in 2023. Because of that, you're allowed to report it as an installment sale where you didn't get paid till 2023. Now you don't have to pay your tax bill till April of 2024. That could be nice. That cash flow saved in your pocket. You can earn the interest on that, or you can go invest it, do what you want with your money, pay that tax bill later. Okay. Um, the same thing applies to the 180 day period. So it makes it much more powerful in the 45 days. So let's say you're closing on September 1st. You do identify properties you were interested in, but for one reason or another, you don't close loans. Either you later were not interested or they sold to someone else, all those things we're talking about. Then the same thing, you're gonna get your money back after day 180, you're gonna end up having to pay your taxes, but you could put the tax bill off for another year. Now I do wanna point out, if you had mortgage debt on the property you sold in 2022, the IRS still sees it that you were relieved of that mortgage debt in the previous year. So you got the mortgage debt relief in 2022, you got the cash back in 2023. Some taxes can be deferred till next year. Some need to be paid on the 2022 tax return. So anyway, let's throw that out there. We'll go to the next one now. I don't wanna spend too much time on that. Now to your question, sir. All right. They came up with really strange rules here. And I think it's entertaining enough to hear the starker story. You may have heard 1031 exchange is called Starker exchanges at some point. And that's because Starker really, to some, we know Starker a lot. He was this guy who owned a ton of timberland out on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, other states. This giant paper company came to him. They figured out how much timber this guy owned and they wanted to buy all of it. And they threw a dollar amount. He just couldn't believe how rich he was. He, he said so many zeros on this number. He immediately said no to their deal. They thought it wasn't enough money. That wasn't it. He was a smart guy. Back then, this is happening, I want to say 1961, 1962, right in that range. The capital gain rates on someone like him on a deal like that were 50 to 60 percent. He was going to lose more than half his money from that giant sale to taxes. He said, no, there's got to be a better way. He eventually figured out 1031. He went back to the giant paper company who, by the way, had upped their offer three or four times in the meantime. So he's getting even more money now. And he said, all right, here's what we're going to do. 
I'm going to deed you all of my property today, and you're not going to pay me anything. So, all right, this sounds pretty good so far, Starker. We know there's a catch. What's going on? Well, I'm going to go find properties, and my great agent out there looking for me for find these properties I want, then giant paper company, you'll pay for those for me and have them deeded into my name. Great. Our only thing is we're a publicly owned company. We can't have an indefinite liability on our books. Mr. Starter, how long is this going to take? He said, I can get it done in five years. All right. It actually only took him two and a half years to find all the properties he wanted. He said to the IRS three years later on his tax return, here's what I did, IRS. Sold all this property, bought all this property. I own nothing. I did a 1031 exchange. Understandably, the IRS freaked out. I said, no, you can't do it that way. You, you, you owe, you know, failed exchange, pay up. Well, he fought it and he fought it and he fought it. And about 20 years later, after many courts of appeals, uh, he won. And the court of appeals said, no, Starker did all the right things. He followed what rule the rule you have laid out IRS, didn't touch the money, did X, Y, and Z, played by the rules, he wins. At that point, the IRS freaked out because they couldn't leave things there. That was the precedent. Nobody smart would ever pay taxes again, right? You'd sell property. 10 years later, if the IRS knocked on your door, you would say, hey, I'm still out there looking for my replacement property. I'm not paying these taxes. I'm doing a 1031. So no one would pay again. So there had to be time limits. In hindsight, I think the IRS could have just said, get it done in a tax cycle. Get it done in a tax year. That would have been fine. But instead, they went overboard on all these rules. And this is really some of the worst of it. So they didn't like the idea because before they made these rules, there were people who would staple the New York City phone book to their identification and say, somewhere there is the property I'm going to buy. And people were literally doing it because you had to identify. People didn't want to know. So they would do crazy things like that. And honestly, the IRS should not have cared. It didn't really matter, but they did care for some reason. So here's what we've got. The three property rule. You can always identify up to three properties with no restrictions of any kind. So the IRS thought this was very kind. They weren't just calling it one for one. You know, that's how they thought of exchanges. They were giving you a couple of backups. Something went wrong, you know, buy B or buy C. They thought this was very kind. People came back and said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, IRS. I'm selling this billion dollar property that I inherited years ago. I don't want all my eggs in one basket anymore. I want to sell this and I want to buy 10, 100,000 properties around Columbus or around the country. I want to be diversified. You know, that's, that's what I'm told. I want you to be diversified. So they want to do that. And the IRS said, oh, all right, we're going to need another rule. The three property rule doesn't work for that person. They came up with the 200% rule. If you name four or more properties, the total aggregate value of all the properties you name can't exceed 200%. Of the value of what you sold. So if you sold for a million, your 200% limit is 2 million. Okay. Again, think back. It doesn't matter. That rule doesn't matter if you're naming three or fewer. If you're naming three or fewer, you can name a property for a million, second property for 2 million, and a third property for 100 million. That's fine. Three or fewer, no restrictions. But if you want to name a fourth property, you'd have to completely redo it because you have to stay within the 2 million limit in that example. So they're strange rules. They really are strange. I mean, they could have done this much better, but they didn't. Now, they came up with this 95% exception. They said, if you break the first two rules, meaning you've named four or more properties and the value exceeds 200% of the value of what you sold, they'll accept it as long as you acquire 95% of all the value on your list. So basically of your list, if even one thing you can't close on, you probably have a totally failed exchange. You don't want to use the 95% exception. Stick to the three property rule or the 200% rule is the takeaway there. So these are strange. Questions about these? So what the three properties means you can identify three and take one out of that? Yeah, you can identify three and then you can end up buying one, two, or all three. Or all three. Yeah. So yeah. maximum three. Yeah, under the three property rule, maximum three. Yeah. Now, again, if you're doing four or more, that's only going to work when your naming some properties are less expensive than the one you sold. So we do have a lot of people who use a 200% rule, but it might be that they're selling for a million, 
and they end up thinking they're going to buy two properties at 500,000 each, right? So they end up naming four properties at 500,000 each, buying two of those, and they're fine. They wouldn't be allowed to name a fifth. It would be over both the three property rule and the 200%. So it's strange stuff. It does, it does cause headaches once in a while based on what people are trying to do. Any other questions about those? All right, next slide, please. All right. I get the question once or twice a week, all the time, where it's, hey, what I really want to do is buy a beautiful home up at Lake Erie or Hilton Head or Florida. And I want it just to be a family vacation. Home. So I'm selling a commercial property in Columbus. I want to buy a beautiful vacation. I said, well, Yes and no, right? Yes and no. We can make that work, but you're gonna have to give a little bit. Uh, a pure vacation home that you're not renting out, not trying to make money with it all, won't qualify as business or investment use. So it's not 1031 eligible. But the IRS came up with something that's very friendly. Quick to the next one. You. Yep. So what they said here, it's very taxpayer friendly. They said, whether this is applying to the property you're selling, or in this case, in our example, we're gonna say the property you're buying, they say, make sure you rent it out at least 14 days in each of the first two years you buy it after you bought it. They say, also, though, don't use it personally more than 14 days or 10% of the total number of days rented if that gives you more than 14 days. So if you're renting it all the time, you rent it 300 days a year, you could use it personally 30 days in that year, and you're still within the safe. But if you can live with that for two years, or you rent it some and have minimal personal use. Once it's year three, you can do anything you want with the property and you can never be challenged. So year three, you could go move into it as a principal residence. You can make it a pure vacation home and never rent it again, or you can keep doing what you're doing. But you can never be challenged if you live with this for 24 months after you buy it. It's called a safe harbor. Which means again, you are safe if you do it. If you're outside of it, it doesn't mean you've broken the law. It just means if you get unlucky and they audit you, they could shoot down. They could basically say, we're not convinced this is investment property for you. Pay your taxes from that sale a couple of years ago. Whatever. Excuse me, it wasn't that. Makes sense? So it's in your book as well. I'll lay it out in detail. All right. Uh, question. Yeah, um, so that last part where the replacement yeah. property must meet the same criteria. If, if the replacement property, if the one you sold, you're, you're renting it out, okay, mm -hmm. to meet all the other standards, mm -hmm. right? But then the replacement property, you would, after 24 months, if you didn't want to rent it anymore, you could that, do that. That's exactly right. Okay. After 24 months, if you want to take your new beautiful Hilton Head property that you didn't like ever having anyone in, right? But you put up with 14 days of rental in yeah. the first two years, that's it. But you know, once you're year three, you can never let anyone besides yourself set foot in there again if you want. Okay. You're fine, never be challenged. But yeah. that becomes you have to start up a principal um, property, right? So what, what happens yeah. where you are living right now? So you can be through at that time. Yeah, I can't remember these slides, but I have stuff coming up, so I'll explain it now. We'll go into more detail if it does come up. But um, if you want to turn something into a principal residence, that's sort of the next best tax break after dying. You know, dying, it becomes a home run, no taxes are owed. But while you're alive, you can make taxes go away by changing a property into a principal residence. So let's take that example. You've sold your commercial property. You know, Sullivan back there helped you sell your commercial property in Columbus but you didn't let them find you another property here. You went and bought a Hilton Head and you do the two years of the minimal rental use. Year three, you move in, right? <clears throat> um, what happens that is strange? Okay, we mentioned section 121 earlier that governs principal residences. It has a caveat that if a property was previously part of a 1031, now you have to own the property for at least five years before taking advantage of that tax break at all. Whereas if it wasn't part of a 1031, the rule is just that you have to live there two of the past five years to get the tax break. But people can do that every two years. You could sell a principal residence every two years and never pay taxes for most people. 
But here you rent it out for two to meet 1031, go move into it in year three. What happens now is every year that you live there makes more and more of the taxes go away. So let's just say you lived there for nine years and now it's time to go to the nursing home, right? So you had two years of rental, nine years as a principal residence, nine elevenths of that tax bill you would have owed goes away and you have to pay two elevenths of it. So every year you're there, more and more of the taxes go away. What's a great thing. Let's say the tax bill was still high and you don't want to pay any taxes. You don't have to sell. You could turn it back into a rental, rent it for a while, then sell, and use 1031. So people do that kind of thing all the time as well. You know, the more years you live there, the more tax goes away. That's that's laid out in there as well. Great questions. Any more? Any other comments right now? Anything else I'm not getting to? And, uh, do we want to go to eight or what were you, what were you thinking? Just so I can plan ahead here. I don't know how long you want me to. We're going to midnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love to do an exchange. Does anyone else have any questions? Well, no, no, we, I have more. I just, I want to plan ahead a little here to get to talk, but was it, was it originally supposed to be six to eight or six, six to eight? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that was we were planning on. I'm not going to see anybody, but I just yeah, want to make uh, sure. Good, is this a good topic? Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's go on, go on through your few more slides. Okay, good. Yeah. I want to make sure I wasn't going to go too long if we did too much stuff, but I know I'll, I'll get you out of here early like I always do, but. All right, there are different types of exchanges. What we've been talking about has been the delayed exchange. That's what 90% of exchanges are, a 45 and 180 day period. You can do something called a simultaneous exchange. If, you know, Jim has the property I want and I have the property he wants, we can just trade deeds. That's the one type of exchange where the IRS does not force you to use a company like ours, the qualified intermediary, to hold the money and do the paperwork, keeping the IRS happy and so on. So if you're really just swapping deeds, you don't have to do business with me, that's sad, but you don't have to. That's a simultaneous exchange. The reverse exchange is if you need to buy your new property before you've sold your old property. Now, that could really be for two main reasons. One can be by design. You come across the new property, you love it, you gotta buy it now. You're gonna go ahead and close on it, but you just maybe don't even have your old property on the market yet. <clears throat> the IRS gives you a way to do it, but they don't make it easy. All right, what they say is you're not allowed to own both properties at the same time. Well, if you're buying the new one first, how do you avoid that? They say you have to use what's called an accommodation title holder, which is generally gonna be our company. We're gonna set up a new LLC. We're gonna take title to that property on your behalf. And from that closing date, the IRS gives you 180 days to get the old property sold now at this point and then complete your exchange. So right now with markets being good, people have not had problems with the reverse exchanges for, for years now. But during the great recession, for example, some reverse exchanges failed. You know, you couldn't get your property sold in 180 days. It just didn't always work. So there's good news, excuse me, and bad news when that happens. The, you know, the bad, well, let's start with the good news. The, the good news is you don't owe any taxes because you haven't sold anything yet. The bad news is you missed your opportunity to defer the taxes from that sale into that property you already acquired. So by law, we're always going to give you that property back within 180 days. So we're going to transfer it over to you, whether your property sold or not. But yeah, if your property didn't sell, you paid us a big fee and you didn't you didn't defer your taxes. So that's not ideal. So you do want to be confident you can get your property sold. The other time reverse exchanges happen is when it happens by accident. You know, you plan to close this week on your sale and next week on your purchase, but something goes wrong. You know, the, the buyer of your deal, their lender falls apart, doesn't, doesn't give them a loan. All of a sudden that gets majorly delayed but the seller of your replacement property isn't gonna wait. You have to close on that one. So that, that's the other kind of reverse uh, really comes into play. Uh, I mentioned fees there, so let me, let me talk about that. Um, fees for standard exchanges, in my mind, are, are fairly reasonable. We charge $1,000 to set up the exchange and handle the sale. We charge $250 for replacement property purchase. So 90% of exchanges have a total fee of $1,250 when all is said and done. You know, that's generally not going to kill most real estate deals. It's, it's pretty reasonable. Uh, reverse and construction exchanges, I'll talk about in just a second. 
much more expensive. So you do have to factor that in depending on how big of a tax hit you might have. Because of the reverse exchange, like I mentioned, we have to go into title for you. A lot of bad things happen to us because of that. You don't really want to be entitled on other people's properties. It's actually not good. Uh, we hold a title to a McDonald's in Phoenix. Someone gets run over in the parking lot and killed. We get sued. We own the property. Uh, what happens quite often is crazy, but we'll own some property somewhere and 10 years, 20 years, even 50 years later, the EPA can find a problem with it. The, the problem was there when we were entitled. They see us, they come after us, sue us for the problem. We try to avoid that, right? Um, so we're doing a lot more homework on these deals. Uh, any kind of a commercial property where you need a phase one that's clean to show there's no environmental problems, you know, underground leaky gas tanks or whatever, whatever else could be out there, because uh, we're not going to want to go into title if it's going to get us in a lawsuit later. We know it has a chance of that. Um, so there's a lot that goes on. They also just take more work in general. Uh, the hardest part can be holding your lender's hand through the 1031 process when the lender's not used to that, maybe. And, we have to go into title first for up to 180 days, then you'll be entitled. There's work. So reverse exchanges for lower priced residential properties started a fee of about $6,000 for that type of exchange and can be several thousand dollars higher for more expensive commercial properties. So you don't do those for a small deal or something with not much tax. Yes, sir. So uh, we are in process of selling this land, right? But uh, this year we bought two houses and we have mortgage on that. Is there any way we can pay these two houses off? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Get that one every day. And unfortunately, I don't have good news on that answer, but the IRS does always require you, they require you to go out and buy a new property. And it really goes back to the thing I said in the beginning of why it's good for the economy. You know, if they just let you pay off debt, that, that doesn't really help anybody. But because they're forcing you to buy a new property, that's a lot of money changing hands. That's people getting paid. That's income taxes and all that good stuff. So unfortunately, they don't let you use your 1031 funds to pay down debt. Yeah, if you acquire new property. Yeah, great question. All right. So after the reverse exchange, we've got the build to suit, also called a construction exchange or an improvement exchange. And again, a few pages, all these things in the book for you. But the general idea here is you're selling your property, let's say for a million dollars, you're gonna buy land for a hundred thousand dollars, but you're gonna build a two million dollar building. Okay, and you say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't that count? Shouldn't I be able to you know spend my money on that and defer my taxes? Well, again, like with the reverse exchange, the IRS says yes, they give you a way to do it, but they do not make it easy. <laughs> okay. The hardest part about a construction exchange is you're still limited to the 180-day period. So we have seen deals through the years where they get a major skyscraper put up in a major city in 180 days. You know, $100 million of taxes on the line. Yeah, they'll work 24-7, uh, 365 to get it done, or in this case, 180 to get it done. Um, we've seen deals where people can't get a patio built in 180 days, right? <laughs> well, I just didn't get around to get the permit, you know. Um, so, you know, that's construction. We, we kind of understand that. So you got to plan ahead. If you're going to do a delayed build the suit, you want to be able to acquire the property very quickly. We're going to go into title on your behalf. Get as much construction done as you can. It's not required that it's complete. But at day 180, we've got to transfer it to you. You'll get credit for whatever the value of the land cost you, plus the completed value of real estate at that point. Reverse build the suit. I used to do these a few years ago, and I was usually dealing with rock stars and corporate CEOs, okay? Because it was aircraft deals. So they would always buy the new aircraft first, because you can't be without an aircraft. Not when you're, you know, at that level. They're always going to buy it first. They're always going to deck it out the way they want it. They're going to spend a ton of money on it, figure out what they want to do with it. Then they're going to uh, sell the old one so they're never without an aircraft. So they're buying first and doing construction and selling. If you're, you know, Kroger and you need to buy it, get a new warehouse up and running or something, you know, you're gonna buy it, you're gonna build it, and get working, and then you're gonna sell the old one once everything's moved over. Um, reverse build the suit, throw those together. So again, complicated and timing is the big issue. Questions about any of the types of exchanges? 
Right. You're very yes, sir. So on the bill to sue, if you acquire land, and sell a, sell a state shopping center, buy land, uh, unless that land equals the cost of the sale of the other property, you could end up uh, having to pay tax because not enough of the building be, uh, is to be built on the new land to be done in six months. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I follow that. Did you say the land alone is as much as the value of what well, you sold? If the land alone is as much as, as the building you sold, then, then you're there. fine. Yeah, you don't have to worry about the construction. We wouldn't need to go into title if that was the case. If you did need to add extra value, then we would go into title, give you know, the rest of 180 days. If you know, if you get some done, but not all of it done, you know, maybe you just defer some more taxes through it, but owe some still. It just depends how much you would get done in that that time period. That makes sense. Okay. Any other questions right now? All right. All right. This isn't really a new type of exchange, but just kind of something you keep in the back of your head that may apply to you once in your life, may not. But we call it the combination exchange. It's using a delayed exchange and a reverse exchange, or it could be the reverse first and the delayed, where you have at least one property in common. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I did one out of Cincinnati a few years back. This company had grown and grown and grown to eventually where they had to buy another office building. And they grew and grew and grew. And they eventually were outsizing two office buildings. So they were going out, they bought this giant one. They were going to put everybody under one roof. So they came to me, they said, All right, we're selling these two, we're buying this one, we want to do a 1031 exchange. I said, Great, it sounds very simple. It's kind of roughly speaking, a $10 million sale, a $5 million sale, and a $20 million purchase. I said, well, not so fast. The 10 million is in contract. The new one we're buying for 20 million is in contract, but the other the second office building we need to sell is not ready yet. We have lease issues, whatnot. They had reasons it wasn't on the market yet. So, okay, you need the combination exchange. We're going to do a regular exchange when you sell that first property for 10 million. You're going to identify a $10 million piece or so of the new $20 million project. If for all your taxes from that first sale, very easy, just close within 180 days. They were already set to do that. But with the other one, that's not going to be ready uh, to even be on the market by the time we buy the new $20 million building. We're going to start a reverse exchange. We're going to take title with you as tenants in common to that, to a portion of your new $20 million building. So maybe they own 75% of it and we own 25% of it. Then from that closing date on the new $20 million building, it now gives them another 180 days to get their second property sold complete the exchange, defer all the taxes from both their old buildings into the new building. Another example would be someone comes to you and, and you're their real estate agent. And they say, all right, I've got 10, $100,000 rentals around town. I want to sell those and buy a million dollar apartment complex, right? So you say, okay, great. Can I package those together and sell them to an investor? And you say, no, 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 I, I want them sold for one off. I'll get the best price that way, I think. So that's what's done. You're good, you get six of the 10 sold before they need to buy the new million dollar apartment complex in that 180 day period. But same idea, you start a reverse exchange when you buy it, giving them another 180 days after the purchase of the apartment complex to get the other four rental properties sold. So a perfect world, you get out to 360 days to sell the 10 instead of 180. Make sense? Yeah. So that's putting two types of exchanges together with at least one encounter, all right? All right, the DST, the Delaware Statutory Trust. Uh, this is a niche product. When I walk into an average room, usually nobody or maybe one person has heard of the DST. Has anyone in this room heard of the Delaware Statutory Trust? Heard of it? Yeah, okay, so that's about right. That's about what we normally get. So, it's interesting. There's something maybe you want to know about. They're probably not always going to be your first choice, um, but they can be helpful in certain cases. So people a few decades ago had a pretty smart idea. They said, why are we letting the major players have all the fun with the real blue chip properties? 
I mean, who can afford to buy a $50 million or $100 million property, whether it's a giant office building in Manhattan, whether it's a perfectly situated apartment complex where there's always a waiting list and high rents, whether it's a bunch of CVS and Walgreens and have corporate backed leases where you know they're going to pay, uh, the perfect industrial properties, the very, very expensive blue chip properties. What if instead of letting just the pension funds and the real estate investment trusts and insurance companies and so on get all those properties, what if we bought those and chopped them into pieces? and sold them off to average investors, where someone could sell a couple of rental properties in Columbus, Ohio, take their $300,000 and invest into some huge project. People loved the idea. For a while, their accountants and their attorneys were nervous about it because they said, well, you sold over here as Joe and you're buying over here and what looks and smells like a partnership with a bunch of other people. We don't know if the IRS can be okay with that or shoot it down. Eventually, the IRS, actually in the year 2000, uh, 2002, they blessed it. So 20 years ago now, they blessed the concept. It was called the securitized ticket at that time, tenants in common. We have a bunch of owners that weren't a partnership, so it made it work. And eventually, over time, it became the Delaware Statutory Trust, which is a better way to manage it. So it's no longer the tick on most of those deals. It's the DST. And the DST is just... Uh, just a way to own the property. But what happens is a company like Inland out of Chicago, they're the biggest player in this market space. They'll go out and they'll buy, again, it could be medical office, apartments, what have you. And they'll pay 50 million, 100 million for these types of properties. They'll go get a loan on it in most cases. Sometimes they do them debt free, sometimes 50% leverage, sometimes 75% leverage. They want it to be able to match up with what investors have coming out of their own deals. And then they'll go out and they'll sell it off. And you don't, you don't want to hear this part. <laughs> Since they're sold as securities, right? They're not sold through real estate brokerages. So only someone with a securities license can, can get a commission. So these are sold through financial planners. But even, even our uh, broker over here, uh, there can be reasons that you'd want to use these for a particular client. Um, sometimes it's if someone just won't sell and you can't get the listing because they don't know what they're going to buy. They want to buy something with no management responsibilities like this, where they just sit back and collect their money every 30 days. Uh, sometimes it's a backup. You know, you're at day 45 and you have the perfect property, but you think, all right, let's name something in case something happens. But a lot of times, I think the most common place I see it is that your, your clients have you. You sold their million-dollar commercial property. You found them exactly what they wanted for $800,000, like one of our early examples. But they don't want to pay tax on that $200,000 difference. So they throw the $200,000 into a DST investment, that type of thing. So, you know, I could talk hours on, on this topic alone. It's a niche product. A lot of you may certainly never, never use it. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's just something good to know about. Yes, please. The key question here to me is is there anything left after a DST, after the, after Inland takes their fees? Yes, yeah, so it's interesting. So the real estate world in a lot of ways is just buyer beware. You go out and buy something, hopefully you've done your due diligence. If something goes wrong, we all know it's really hard to sold, excuse me, sue the person who sold you that property and get your money back somehow. It's not where you want to be. With securities, it is a little different. They will tell you everything because if even 50 years down the road, you decided they left off something material, you're going to have a good lawsuit. You're probably going to get your money back if someone still exists to sue. So securities are very different. You're going to get that prospectus that's going to be that thick, and they're going to tell you if anyone ever sneezed on the property. So they're going to lay out exactly what all their fees are, exactly what your cash on cash return is going to be. And these things are not meant to be home runs. These aren't going to be as good as the properties that this guy is going to find there. This is really meant for that scrap or that little bit where you don't want to pay all your taxes and you know the, the return doesn't have to be as good to justify it. A lot of these over the last few years have been four, five, six percent cash on cash returns. And then sometimes, uh, well, and I most of the time over this past decade or so, because we've been in a good period of real estate, 
they're getting great sales prices on these and your overall return shoots up quite a bit. Okay. Um, that won't last forever. You know, real estate will trend. Um, but I can tell you from watching people do this for two decades now, a lot of people have been, the vast majority of people have been happy with these investments who are doing them. And they decide when they come out of one, they reinvest back into another one. Say tax deferred. And it's like any other real estate. You own it. They're set for a certain time period. They'll tell you up front, we're going to stay invested for five years, then go sell this property. And we're going to stay seven years, go sell this property. So you can plan for that. A lot of times they've sold quicker because they've got amazing offers. Because that's the that's the market we've been in. So when that happens, they come to you and they say, hey, we're going to close in 60 days. You know, congratulations, you got a 40% return on this one. And then they're going to try to get you to roll into another investment. But you don't have to. You can take it out of your own 1031 and go find your own property at that point. You can take your money and pay the taxes. You know, it's no different than other real estate other than really in the end, you have no control over it, right? Somebody else is managing the property. So that's going to be very different for a lot of you. And it's a security versus just, just real estate. But many of the people, too many people use it as sort of a third uh, property to, to identify as a, as a, a backup. As a backup. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People throw it out there as a backup. Questions on this? All right, please. Uh, do you have a question? Okay. And my thinking is correctly if you did that, you don't have to do the same value of what you sold. You only have to do the 200 gain, per se, on a trust. Uh, all the same rules of the 1031 still apply. So, so you know, if you sold, but what's nice about these really is that if you sold for $212,000.50, you can go reinvest $212,000.50 if you can buy exactly what you want to buy. You know, you can throw whatever you have to do to pull them out of the sale. But you still have to follow all those earlier rules. Yeah, if you had mortgage debt on what you sold, most of these, like I said, have debt built into them already. So it's 50% leverage. You can use that to make up for your mortgage debt. Um, yeah, they're an interesting product. Yeah, so if you do a DST, you still have to go through an intermediator like you're selling. Yeah, everything's still the same. It's it's just that instead of having the good sense to buy the replacement products for you, they're buying it through a financial plan. You know, it's, it's organic. Add a little extra with the leftover one because yeah, it really does happen where especially someone sells for 10 million, they buy for 9 million, but they don't want to buy a million dollar property. They like big properties. Throw them in there. Okay. Um, any other DST questions? All right, next slide, please. And you can skip past that one. All right, seller financing, I'll just mention here. There's a page in the book. It's a little bit complicated, though. Really, you want to avoid it. When you're the seller on the front end of an exchange, a buyer comes to you and wants you to do seller financing, you probably just want to avoid that unless that's the only way you get your property sold. And I say that for 1031 purposes. The reason is the IRS treats it for 1031 purposes as if you received all of the money at the time of closing, you know, even though a huge chunk of it you're going to get paid down the road, right? That much financed. finance. So when our clients are doing seller financing, there's only a few ways to keep it tax deferred. Right? The first is when they act more like a third party lender, like they're the bank versus a seller financed. So for example, if they did 100,000 of seller financing for their buyer, they would actually bring the 100,000 to the closing table, provide it the way the bank would provide it. Then that money gets into their exchange account and stays tax deferred. If they don't do that, it's gonna be taxed. Another way potentially they can get around it, we do see this from time to time, but not really often. You can make the note for the 1031 exchange. The note actually gets sent to us just like the cash does. We put it in a physical safe in Chicago and we have to hold it as part of the proceeds. And then they have to use the note in some way in the 1031. Sometimes, it's creative, and not that often, but sometimes they actually find a seller willing to take that note as part of the deal when they go to buy the replacement property. Once the parties know each other, or they actually know who the person who owes on the note is. 
um, they're willing to take that. Uh, sometimes the, the exchanger themselves buys it back before day 180 and before they buy the replacement property. So they didn't have the cash to act as a third party lender on the front end, but they get the cash later. They can buy their note back and get their cash into their exchange, things like that. So short, short answers on that. There's more information in the book, but the, the, the real takeaway is try to avoid doing seller financing on property you sell. On the property you buy, if you want to use seller financing, yeah, but no problem at all. You'll get credit for that, just like if you got it from a bank. So you still want to use your cash you know, coming out of town payment, but if you can borrow the rest from the seller, great. All right. Let's talk about the best topic of the night. <laughs> me. <laughs> so you've heard me say this term, qualified intermediary tonight. That comes from the Treasury regulations. With capital Q, capital I, qualified intermediate. I mean, that must be something special. All right, I'm going to show you the list. All oh, it's, it's a long book. I'll show you the list of all the qualifications you have to have to do my job. <laughs> None. There are zero qualifications to being a qualified intermediary. The name really comes from the fact that you're not allowed to be disqualified. Okay, who's disqualified? Well, so unfortunately, yeah. your, your broker is disqualified, your attorney, your CPA, your financial planner, they're all disqualified because you can't have an agency relationship between the QI and the exchanger. There's other people you would expect to be disqualified, your relatives, your employees. They want this to be a third party who, in essence, you can't twist their arm. There's an independent party to hold the money and do the paperwork, keeps the IRS happy. So, you know, because there are no qualifications, you, you do have to be a little scared because anyone can do this business. And sadly, there's a lot of anyone's who shouldn't be doing this business who do this business, okay? Uh, billions of dollars have been stolen, lost through <clears throat> stupidity, lost through bankruptcy of the QI. So, you know, I don't wanna turn this into a commercial for us, I mean, I really do, but I don't. Um, but really, you're looking at financial strain. And like Ann said earlier tonight, uh, we are by far the largest company in the country doing this, owned by that parent company, Fidelity National Financial. These giant insurance companies are our sister companies. And why that's huge is because they are nice enough to guarantee every deal that we do. So one of the documents you get in your package from us when you start an exchange a document is in there that's the guarantee of the title companies that Ann is with. And they say, uh, they don't actually use this language. It says, if Greg runs off with your money, we have to make you whole. So they guarantee every deal up to $50 million per exchange. So we've been in business in the 1980s. No one's gonna steal your money. We're, we're, we're very good, we're very safe, but things do go wrong. You know, there's any company has bad employees, things happen. So if it happens with us, you're going to get your money back. If it happens with a lot of other companies, I've, I've gotten the tearful phone calls. I've gotten many of them through the years. Um, really, I've gotten a person that, I was at your seminar, and I just, I went with another company. They were $100 cheaper, that kind of thing. They're not answering my phone calls anymore. Say, so, yeah, I've, I've heard about that guy. It's a guy down in Florida. Yeah, you're, he's gone. You're not getting your money back. That's over. You might as well start planning to not get your money back. And I've, you know, there's been billion dollar sales that we've seen had to deal with billion dollar, uh, billion stolen that we've had to deal with big, big chunks. Um, so we're not the only good company, but honestly, there's probably only a handful that are big enough and financially strong enough that you should work with. Uh, all right, what else? Um, more slides, but I think I want to make sure, you know, we're almost out of time. We can really, uh, uh, call it an anytime people are ready or we're there. But anything I didn't get to, any topics you wanted to hear about, anything that I went over too quickly? Yeah, please. Well, the third block there where you say you prepare legal documentation, does right. that include uh, the tax uh, filing? Yeah, so we're not allowed to do that. So we're allowed to prepare the exchange agreement, the assignments of contract, all the documents you need to do your exchange. They don't let us, I, I'm a lawyer, I'm still licensed and everything. 
uh, but they don't let us give legal or tax advice. So we're not allowed to do your tax form. So you or your account will still do that. But the documentation we would give to you, you just give it to your CPA. Or That's right. At the end of every exchange, we're going to give you what's called a final account statement. And it's really going to have the information your CPA needs. Yep. And we're always happy to talk to them and answer questions. We just can't give legal or tax advice. Yep. Yep. Good question. Uh, I always like to point out, too, that we never charge anything for consultations. Um, our whole history of our company, we don't charge anything for that. So you call us up and say, hey, let's have a conference call with you know, my attorney, my accountant, me, and so on. Let's see if this works. A lot of times it doesn't work. A lot of times I'll say for one reason or another, you know what, in the end, you can't do that. Um, it's going to cost you nothing. If it does work, you can still decide to go work with someone else. It's only if the deal closes. The money gets sent to the exchange account. We take out our thousand dollar fee when the money comes in. Before we wire out the new property, we'll take out our two hundred fifty dollar fee. It's, it's that simple. We don't charge by the hour. We don't charge you anything else. Um, anything else? <clears throat> yeah. A question on the Please. on the tax period. For example, uh, we have. Uh, Purchase having this year, but some some of them will not be closed until next year. Right. Like you have something close this year, or uh, so let's say this way: some of them close this year, some of them close next year. Right. Mm -hmm. So what shall I be prepared in that context? Yeah. So the key, first of all, is going to be that your sale, the relinquished property side, happened this year. Yes. Uh, so that's the first thing you're really concerned with. Yeah. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you're still going to complete your exchange before you have to file your taxes. Um, so based on when you're started, you know, I don't it probably doesn't go past April 15th. If it did and you weren't done, you gotta ask for your extension. Um, but when you go to file your taxes by April 15th for the 2022 tax year, you're probably going to be done with your exchange and you're just giving them all the information at that point. You're going to file a form 8824. That's what shows you've done a 1031 exchange. And most of the form is pretty straightforward. It's a lot of when did you sell? How much did you sell for? Did you identify within 45 days? What day did you identify? How much did you buy for? When did you buy? To make sure you followed the deadlines and the numbers. Um, they ask a lot of questions about related parties, which we didn't talk about tonight. You're not supposed to buy your replacement property from a related party. So that can be a problem. They ask a lot of questions about that. And then only the really the last section is a little complicated. That's where it's, hey, what was the tax basis of your old property? And you get into the real accounting part of it. But most of the form's pretty straightforward. But yeah, you're gonna you're gonna file that form 8824 by April of next year, and you'll have completed your exchange for that form. Yes. Speaking of related uh, parties, if you sold a million dollar property. And you wanted to buy a two million dollar property uh, with a relative, and you chip in a million, yeah. and they chip in a million. That's yeah, that would, yeah, that would fine. Okay, right. It's, you're even allowed to sell property to a related party. But you just can't buy the replacement property right. from a related party. In most cases, there are of course some exceptions. Um, but in your case, you're talking about you sold for a million. You want to go go buy a two million dollar property and have a partner. Right. And that partner is allowed to be a relative or a non-relative. Doesn't matter at all. The only key is again, it can't be a partnership at the beginning. It's fifty percent going to Jim's name. Fifty percent can go to the partner. So you're going to satisfy your numbers a million for a million. They're getting the other million. That's fine. What a lot of CPAs tell their clients is once you get to January of the next year, so you're into the next tax year. If you guys want to contribute your interest into a two-member LLC at that point, something like that, you're probably fine to do so. Yeah. Originally, you've always got to match up to show the same tax credit. Great. <clears throat> when, when is the best time to contact you when you know you're selling a property? You do it at day of the closing? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> or do you do it like you want to give up a little heads yeah. up? Yeah. So, the answer is no and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I we, get, we, get, that one. <laughs> we, we get calls all the time from the clothing. I mean, across the country, all the time. People come in. Sometimes it's, oh, they thought someone else had taken care of it. Yeah. Was, uh, their attorney in line. So we just went through two hours of what a 1031 is. I don't think you want to wait for the last minute. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. It's possible to, uh, it makes everyone's life easier. Right. It gets the earlier the better. Certainly, get to us at least try to be a few days before the, the closing. How about a month or so? <laughs> we, we do charge it too. We're, we're, we'll, we'll work very fast. We can do that because we're big. If it's the same day or the next day, we charge a $250 much fee, but we'll still get it done. Um, but yeah, no, I get the call all the time from the closing table. We say, okay, that's not ideal, but get a cup of coffee, ask the title company to send us the contract, the title commitment. We'll stop everything. We'll review those right now. We'll draft your documents, get them out to you. We used to always say we can probably get that done in an hour. That was pre COVID craziness. During COVID craziness, we had to add rush fees and it wasn't always an hour. Um, but we can get it done very quickly. So it's never too late as long as you haven't completely closed yet. But yes, be, be kind, like he's saying, let us know as early as possible because we can do a better job for you if we can talk through things then. Yeah, I always like last minute. <laughs> No, thank you, sir. Final question. Yeah. 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 Uh, I want I want everyone to kind of dangle a little bit, do a little networking. It's important to know who we are, what we are, uh, and why we're here. I mean, we're all investors. We're all looking to uh, build a real estate portfolio, and I think this is a great opportunity. Um, I've been doing. I've been real estate I think, twenty-seven years now. Um, after a certain point, you don't even think about it anymore. But uh, uh, like I've been working with Dan in Chicago, I, I, I want you to know the good people that we're working with because it makes our job easier. It makes their job easier. They know it. Um, so uh, I want you to you know shake Greg's hand before you leave. Make sure you know who he is. Uh, talk to Ann because uh, if, we're, if you're doing a deal through me, we're going to be I, we're going to be talking to Ann anyway because I I I, I throw our documents over to her. Uh, if I get a listing, I send it right over to her. Uh, I know right away what's going to be happening and how, how this transaction could be managed properly. So, um, again, this is the first of the series. Uh, <clears throat> the importance of my next class will be in the first of the year, probably late January or early February. We haven't mapped it out yet, but it's going to be about cost segregation and the value of that. If you're um, buying retail centers, uh, what value that's going to bring to your table and the tax savings that will be. Uh, so watch for that in the future. We'll keep you on our, um, um, what I call my preferred client list. So people uh, that are doing business that want to continue to do business. Um, who knows, one day we might be working, we might be working with somebody in this room on a transaction. So that's why I want you to network also. So, great. All right. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your, your time today. And uh, again, uh, I appreciate you at, at Chicago Title and LA National. Um, so thanks, thanks everybody. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, by the way, um, um, Allie has a gift for uh, our guests today. Um, they're out on the table here. Uh, we put a little package here. There's a uh, millionaire real estate investor book. I think it's appropriate for what we're doing. I want to make sure that uh, our clients pick pick one up before you leave. Um, so uh, please, please do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.